So could you please start by saying and spelling your name? Sure, my name is Brian Mandeville, E-R-I-A-N-M-A-N-D-E-V-I-L-L-E. -E -E. Okay, and today is Thursday, August 9th, 2018, and we are at Full Steam Brewery in Durham, North Carolina. I'm Richard Cox, talking today with Brian Mandeville, head brewer as part of the Well-Crafted North Carolina project. So we can start, if you just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, my background was not in brewing. I was uh, I went to undergraduate for political science. I worked as a field organizer for political campaigns. Uh, I worked for the New York Times for a little bit, um, and uh, kind of my career ended up going a really different direction. I think largely a lot of it had to do with the economy at the time. Mm -hmm. Work was not easy to come by. About when was this? Um, it's so bad that I can't remember. Years. <laughs> um, I guess kind of late, um, late, early, or I don't even know what we call it, the decade of the 2000s that doesn't have a number in front of it. There you go. Yeah. Um, but late that time period, uh, kind of early. So like maybe around 2010. Oh, so around time of the recession. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, got okay. it. Okay. So, um, so. I was. I had applied to grad to graduate programs. They all said I was a great candidate, but they wanted me to have experience. I'd applied to a bunch of experience. They said I was a great candidate, but they wanted me to have a grad degree. Um, so I kind of started considering a lot of alternatives. And most of my family and friends were like, "All you ever talk about, all you seem to ever want to do is make beer. Why don't you try to make a career out of it?" And at the time, I had thought that was about as realistic as someone saying they wanted to be a basketball player or. A yeah. rock star like I was like yeah sure I'll be a brewer <laughs> um, that's realistic um, but I just started reaching out to breweries and told them what my experience was I'd been home brewing for a really long time uh, never worked professionally yeah and basically just said I'll come work for free I just want to get my foot in the door and um, I started working under a brewer had been in the industry for about 25 to 30 years so it was Chris O'Connor um, Chris had been really important in the Smutty Nose um, kind of chain of breweries. Mm -hmm. He helped get uh, Portsmouth Brew Pub up and running. And uh, he had come down to Virginia to work at a brewery called O'Connor Brewing Company that had nothing to do with him. Yeah. Um, totally different <laughs> O'Connor, kind of. Convenient. Yeah. <laughs> so um, he was the head brewer there, and they're in Norfolk, Virginia. So I trained under him for a while. I ended up going back to school for brewing. and. Um, one thing led to another, and I ended up at Full Steam. Um, so, so before you were in Virginia, you were up in New York, I guess. No, um, so I was in, I went to school in Virginia. I, yeah, I'm okay. a military brat, so I kind of grew up all over. But uh, I went to college in Virginia, and then my first brewery job was in Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, okay. So, so that's so, where I was before here. So uh, you said you've been in home brewing for a while before you even got into that's right. Pub. So how'd you get started at home brewing? Um, there's kind of two elements of it. One of them is that uh, my family on both sides, my grandparents, um, did fermentations at home. Um, so seeing some of that made it maybe seem less like this like mysterious weird thing and more of just something that people do. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandpa made muscadine wine, for example. Neither one of them were making beer. Um, but uh, I think it was a high school chemistry class, actually. That makes, where we, yeah. we talked about the process of fermentation, and it seemed like unnervingly simple to me after it was explained. This is basically like, and in class it was pretty, it was like not the focus of that lecture, and so it was pretty much just like, yeah, I mean, uh, yeast, which is a fungus, consumes some source of sugar, um, and the byproducts of which are predominantly ethanol, CO2, some heat as a result of biological activity, but, and then some other comp compounds, esters, phenols, but like nothing. But the major process is just sugar, yeast, alcohol. Um, and that day, my friends and I went home and tried to make our, our first batch of, at that time, wine. But um, how'd that go? Not great. <laughs> not great. We used baker's yeast. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, we were fermenting in milk jugs with like balloons with like holes poked in them with airlocks. Um, it was terrible. Uh, but you know, quickly we started um, learning a lot more about it. And, um, we started making mead, and uh, I think I started brewing beer. This is all well before I legally should have been doing any of this. Yeah. But 
Um, started brewing beer, I think, my first batch was junior year of high school. Oh, wow. um, and then kept up with it uh, into college and you know, afterwards. So it um, yeah. kind of became, so it had been doing it for a while uh, by the time I was kind of looking to get into professional brewing. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned you like the school for brewing, where was that? Um, yeah, I just I didn't do anything crazy. I didn't like you to go to Germany and, and sure. do some, like I just basically did this online concise course through uh, Siebel, which is a oh, right. based out of Chicago. Um, I had been brewing at the time for three or four years and felt like I had uh, a lot of good practical experience, but I didn't al always really fully understand maybe the science of what we were doing or, or how everything worked. So. Um, I really viewed that as a, a valuable way to kind of like fill in the gaps between what I knew how to do and maybe what, why we did it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. It does. So, um, so once you got into the industry, like what resources did you start drawing upon to help you grow as a brewer? Um, other brewers mainly, uh, especially when I was getting into the industry, um, it was it's really crazy to talk about. I've only been brewing for about eight years. That's not a long time to be in any industry. In the grand scheme of things but when i started brewing to now are two totally different places so when i started brewing there wasn't a lot of resources out there um, a lot of the stuff that i hope that's not going to cause uh, a lot of the stuff that was out there was not great and a lot of like a lot of the online stuff was just like home brewers who like had tried something but maybe didn't like there wasn't good actual hard information right. um, so i had all the stuff that most people did like john palmer's how to brew um, the joy of home brewing, like the classic like yeah. home brewing books, but I didn't have anything more professional than that. Um, so I relied really heavily on more experienced brewers. So I was really fortunate um, to work under Chris while he was at O'Connor, but he left not long after I had been there. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a couple of different mentors. Uh, most noteworthy was probably Alan Young, who was a brewer who at the time was working at um, a Gordon Beer Brew Pub in Virginia Beach. Alan had been brewing for for a long time and was super knowledgeable and also uh, very much to my benefit really willing to share stuff so if i had a question or was unsure about something or just wanted to understand something more uh, he was definitely someone we reached out to quite a lot and but even you know luckily especially then people were super willing to share information and be pretty transparent about process or so i, I leaned pretty heavily on other brewers as far as yeah. Especially earlier, early in my career. Yeah, well, and you were making a move from home brewing to production, which of course is, there are going to be hurdles. Yeah. So, were there any you can think of as like, you just walked into your production brewery first time and you're like, okay. I think, you know, I had done a lot of looking into what production brewing was actually like before I decided I wanted to try to get into it. Um, I think most of the people that I know who are first getting into the industry are not super familiar with what a production brewery is like. So um, I think I got to avoid some of the surprises that most people do. But I think even just stuff like, you know, it's weird to say this, but I think if somebody wanted a brewing job and they came in and they were like, I already know how to work clamps and, and gaskets, and I'm familiar with both thin fittings and tri clover. And, like those are the things that as a brewer you use every day, day in, day out, and they're not the kind of thing that a home brewer will likely have much experience with. That's changing. I mean, Blickman's definitely making a lot of equipment for home brewers that has like the clamps and gaskets that a professional brewery uses. They're much smaller, but um, you know that's the kind of stuff that like we use every day, and that's like the bread and butter of what we do. And it's not the um, it's not particularly glamorous, and it's. It's yeah. certainly not something you'll have experience with in Humber. So you, you'll know how to map, like you'll know what someone's saying when they're like, all right, we're going to go in and our liquid risk ratio is this and we're brewing this kind of beer. But actually how you do any of that. Um, and it's weird because I feel like when someone goes from being like a home cook to wanting to learn to be a chef, like a lot of those skills are much more transfer transferable. And maybe you've never prepped hundreds of potatoes at a time, but you've peeled potatoes before. Like, so it's the scale even when you're going from like brewing five gallons at a time to brewing like five barrels at a time that scale difference can be pretty significant which is 
weird to think about because it's really volume wise not that much more. Right. But so um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like things that really shocked me or I wasn't really. What was there a, how about hurdles you remember when you first got started in production? Um, Way back when. I think uh, luckily I had been doing some landscaping stuff, so like yeah. the physical demands of it, I was more ready for. And even the, um, I don't think that I had probably realized that I was going to be working in like unconditioned warehouses for for as a career. <laughs> but um, I was well ready for it. Like so, I, I didn't really bother me too much that it was too hot or too cold, but. Um, I definitely struggled with with um, with packaging lines, like canning line. We had a bottling line, um, and that was like a. It felt like none of us fully understand what we were doing, and that every time it worked out, it was kind of a miracle versus like an achievement. And especially early on, I felt like we were just fumbling in the dark with none of us had ever bottled before. We've yeah. got this machine. There's no, you know, there are other brewers we've contacted, but they, you know, they give you. They're not showing up to help us get it running, so it's it was a total nightmare. I mean, <laughs> bottling uh, before I had before any of us had any experience with it was like, yeah. and it just felt like anything could have gone wrong, and none of us would have had any clue what to do. Right. So the good news about that experience, though, was that like I think a big thing that that a lot of people struggle with in brewing is that. There's no cavalry. There's no backup. Like the production team you have is it, mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff we work with is so specialized that there's not even a person. There's not like a professional to call in. So you can get an electrician to come in to help you repair something, but they don't know what you're talking about. So you need to know enough to tell them what needs to be repaired. Um, you can get an HVAC guy to look at your glycol system. They've never likely worked on a glycol system that's the size. Even if they're an industrial HVAC, like they're not. They're used to really large AC units. They are not used to something that does that kind of process. So, like, you can have them look at that, but they're not going to be able to troubleshoot what's wrong with it. So, that you need to have, to know enough about what's wrong with it to have them work on it. If that makes sense. No. It so, does. bottling lines and canning lines are definitely that way. There's nowadays it's funny because there is a increasingly so a support network that exists, but back then. Like when something went wrong with your bottling line, like you'd call another brewer and they'd be like, "Oh man, I hope that never happens to me." Because <laughs> I hope I have a bottling line one day. Yeah, and yeah. you the but you and you could call the manufacturer and they would be helpful, but the most they're going to be able to do is tell you what to do over the phone. Right. So it was that was a hard learning curve. For that's sure. not yeah, that sounds. Awesome. So what's the setup at Full Steam in the back? As far as brew house or yeah or so our brew house is pretty unique. Um, the original rig was designed as an all-in-one with two vessels stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So you would mash into the bottom, transfer to the top, lauder from the top back into the bottom, boil in the bottom, transfer to the top for whirlpool, and then knock out of the top to the tank. Okay. So it was very difficult with that setup to really stack batches or do or gain a lot of efficiencies. So Full Steam got a separate mash lauder ton. So when I started here, they already had the separate mash lauder ton and separate. Um, and then at that point, we're just using that other vessel as a boil kettle. Okay. So um, sizing gets complicated. Our mash lauder ton is, I think it's technically a 30 barrel, but it's more, it feels more like an oversized 20, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and the, in the sense that I think we would struggle to do certain ABV beers if we used it as a 30. Um, but as a 20, you could probably do anything. Um, so like my, one of the first recipes I did here was uh, wheat wine that was uh, like 75% wheat. Like there was no reason that beer should have been able to lauder as well as it did. It was just because we had this ridiculous oversized mash lauder time. So then our, our kettle is in hectoliters, but we it gets way more complicated than it should be. Let's hear but, it. Fundamentally, the way to think about it, we boil around 14 barrels, and due to the, the design of our kettle, we normally get about 12 barrels out of it. So at any given time, we're, we're knocking out about 12 barrels. Most of the 10-barrel rigs I've worked on, that's the same way, because the 
most of the 10 barrels rigs I've worked on, we pushed to the point where you could get 12 or so barrels out so that by the time we were filtering everything, you could get 10 barrels of finished beer. So normally the short answer that I tell people is, think about it like a 10 barrel brew house. We normally are boiling about 14 barrels. We're normally knocking out about 12. Okay. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's sense. perfect. That, so makes that sense. is a wildly complicated no, it's well, normally, I mean, it's normally a simple question. Well, every every setup's different, right? So it's it's a question that's really interesting to ask because it tells it tells a lot more than some people think. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would I mean, say so. yeah. Um, so to talk about full stain for a little while, um, how would you, from your perspective, describe full stain to people who are totally unaware of the brewery? Okay, um, so I normally start with where we're based. So I just say like you know, full stain is a uh, is a brewery based out of Durham, North Carolina. Um, I think the thing that sets us apart or what makes Full Steam unique is that we focus um, really heavily on farmed and forage beer. So that means beers that rely really heavily on the both agricultural traditions of, of the Southeast and specifically North Carolina, um, as well as kind of traditions beyond that. Um, so all of our beers have some sort of component coming from North Carolina. Um, and most of them, that's kind of the driving focus. Um, so, yeah, I guess normally the, the, the elevator pitch is farmed and foraged beers from Durham, North Carolina. There you are. Um, so what would you say then, which ties into that, is the main mission or theme of Full Stay? So our, our mission or focus is to, I'm not gonna get the exact wording of our mission right no, now. No, that's all the, you. The idea is basically, to help connect, or in some ways reconnect, um, the the people who live here to kind of have, to the agriculture that has been here for as long as for as long as anybody's been here. I mean, the so this idea of kind of like fostering a community around the idea of of agriculture and using beer as like a way to kind of facilitate that, and beyond that, develop um, we use the term. Uh, Southern beer economy, right. but it's this idea that you know it's sometimes difficult to get people to really focus heavily on spending a lot of money on local agriculture. Um, it's easy to get people to pay, pay for beer, um, or easier sometimes. Sure. And even like, it's really easy for me to get excited about an ingredient like candy roaster squash mm -hmm. and like want to know more about that and where did that come from and who's growing that and it's not always super exciting for. You're, you know, just a normal consumer or customer, but if it's if I'm able to make a beer that's really intriguing and tastes good and people are excited about it, the conversation about that candy roaster squash becomes so much easier. Right. So that's kind of in my in my head. That's often what I think of as kind of not like a, what we're doing. So like we make that both the the economics of it as well as the story of it. Um, easier by using beer as a vehicle for all of these things and that's easy because it, as long as it's good beer right. people tend to be more willing and interested um, so we have this unique position where we get to kind of act as a translator between mm -hmm. um, between like farmers and, and consumers so farmers markets serve that kind of similar purpose I like to think of us as kind of like the beer version of a farmers market there you go yeah, and I think a lot of people forget that North Carolina is still primarily a rural state. And so, it still is. I mean, yeah. I think, and, you know, we talk about the post facto stuff a lot as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a very rural state, and it's a state that has relied for a long time on agriculture, and it's a state that primarily relied on tobacco agriculture mm -hmm. for, for a very long time. And we're in this period now where there's still a lot of farmland, there's still a lot of folks who want to use that as farmland, um, and we very much need farmers, <laughs> so it's good that that's the case. But they need viable alternative crops to tobacco, and our hope is that in some small way that the purchases we make, and ultimately the purchases that people make from us, help to, to provide more realistic alternatives to tobacco um, in a state that has a lot of good reasons to want to continue to be an agriculturally driven state. Sure, absolutely. Um, and what, um what role do you feel breweries such as Full Steam have played in changes in Durham or other local communities? Um, Durham's changed a lot since Full Steam opened. So. Durham has changed a ton. It's mm -hmm. tough to, you know, 
I think in many ways we're humbled and honored to be part of of what's happened in, in, in Durham. It's hard to talk. It's very chicken and an egg as far right. as like, um, we were one of the early businesses to move into this part of town. Um, this part of town has grown a ton and doesn't look anything like it did when we came here. How, how would you describe? Because we're not, we're not quite in down, we're not quite in downtown. Yeah, so we're, um, for, it's, pe for people who don't know, you know. I don't know what the official name of this neighborhood is, but I think most people probably would say it's near Central Park or mm -hmm. near the farmer's market. Um, I think Central Park is maybe the name of the neighborhood, but, um, you know, the part we're in was, there were a lot of warehouses here, a lot of, um, a lot of auto shops, um, right. and there wasn't a whole lot else. And for the most part, these buildings were empty. So um, when we came in, you know, Motorco wasn't a thing, Coco Cinnamon wasn't a thing, Gear Street wasn't there. So the only thing that was really over here was Kings, which okay. I gotta give full credit to Kings for. Um, and then the old, the old Durham Bulls uh, ballpark. Right. Um, outside of that, this little corner didn't really have much to speak of. Um, obviously, there's some housing and stuff, but like as far as businesses go, sure. Um, so, I think that we've been heavily involved with kind of that change that this neighborhood has seen. Um, but it's hard to know how much of what's happened both in this neighborhood and Durham as a whole. Mm -hmm could really be accredited to us and how much of it is just like, I think in many ways we we were earlier than a lot of folks were on Durham's growth and change, but mm -hmm. I think we came in at the right time in many ways. Like Durham was, was changing. I, I think what Pulsing definitely did mm -hmm. is provide uh, this a focal point in this neighborhood uh, for people to meet. People may be meeting not even for beers, just a plate like, a space that people could meet at and hang out at that was fairly casual and that didn't have an expectation of even purchase. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. hopefully when people come to Pulsing, we hope that they want to have our beer. But right. at the same time, if you want to bring your kids here or, you know, it's the expectation isn't that like everyone who comes in the door is going to have a beer. Right. So um, I think providing that space made a big difference in this, at least especially in this neighborhood. Cool. Awesome. So let's pull back around to your poli sci back world and your back world background and your field organization and talk about um, community engagement and fundraising. And that's full steam has been very engaged in a lot of different organizations in the community and activism. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about it or talk about it? Um, sure. Uh, it's tough because like so much of the the team here. Um, from the owner Sean down to our delivery guys are all pretty engaged and passionate people. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that attracts a lot of people to full steam and especially want to work here is the level of kind of involvement we have in the community. Community is really important to us and it's part of our mission and part of our focus. Like we want, um, we're really fortunate to be in such an amazing place and community. And I think in many ways we have a responsibility to get back to that. So. Sometimes that means fundraising for things like um, Full Frame, uh, mm -hmm. which is an amazing documentary film festival that's held here. It's I can't remember the specific accolade. I want to say it's the biggest one in North America. It may be more than oh wow. It may be more yeah. significant than even that, but it's a really impressive thing, and I don't think it's something that even a lot of folks fully realize is here. But we, you know, we have a long partnership with helping to support um, Full Frame because that's an amazing thing. But so everything from like that to like. Uh, we work a lot with Triangle Land Conservancy, uh, which is a really amazing group that's protecting a lot of, uh, keeping a lot of land around here wild, both for people to enjoy, so open parks, but then also closed spaces that are more for wildlife and water uh, water rights, and trying to make sure the watershed is protected. They do some really amazing work, so working with folks like that, to working with the North Carolina Museum of Art, or um, even beers that have been more focused on single issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, I guess what I, I'm all over the place, but I mm -hmm. guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's tough to know maybe how to approach this question, because sure. there, it's such a, there's so many different ways that we, we, uh, we do that, but I think the biggest thing is just that kind of recognizing and acknowledging the importance that this community has had to our success, right. and knowing that it would be I mean, it's like impossible for me to think of a way 
that we continue to move forward that doesn't involve that community. Sure. So um, being heavily involved with it and, and supporting it in any way we can has always been, and it's also super rewarding. Like, um, right. you know, it's, it's cool to be involved in so many different things that are like really exciting happening in the triangle or happening in Durham. Like, mm -hmm. um, even if I didn't work at full frame or work at full seam, I would think that full frame is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, same with TLC. And there are properties where parks that I had been going before we started working with them. Mm -hmm. I was a fan of what they were doing anyway. So when that opportunity came up, it was it was just cool to be like, wow, this is something that I really appreciate that's in the triangle. Right. And that I'm super glad is here and there's actually something I could do to help them out. Um, which just felt like an amazing win win. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. Yeah. So you started here in December of 2014, I believe. Right. So when you first walked in the door in full steam, what were your first impressions? Um, so I think I had had full steam spears before, but the first time it actually come to the brewery was for a working interview. Um, I think maybe a month or so before that, and um, I had only ever even like passed through Durham. I had not really even spent any time here. So I think in many ways it was an introduction both to the company and the people who work here, but also the town. Mm -hmm. um, my family on both sides from Georgia. Uh, so I passed all over from Virginia to Georgia and back again. Um, and I'd spent maybe an evening in Durham before, but that was about it. So um, I don't know, first impressions were and the major thing was that the the people who I worked with that day, so like the production team at the time, um, some of them are still here, some of them aren't, but were just like incredibly um, driven and hardworking and focused people, and they're also incredibly friendly, which yeah. is big. Um, so I think that that was the major kind of takeaway I had was was the team who was here and. Uh, they seemed really eager and excited to have have me have me here as well, which felt great. So yeah. um, I'm not sure though. It's I'm trying to think of like what what was like the first thing I thought when I walked in the door, like <laughs> um, when I was like driving away from here. Uh, huh. I'm not sure. Great production team. There it is. So um, since that time, how would you think Full Steam's come to reflect your personal brewing approach, interest, or philosophy? Well. In many ways, what attracted me to Full Steam was was that they were already doing a lot of the things that I got that I really wanted to be doing. So, um, a big part of the reason when I uh, applied for the job here, I didn't even know Full Steam was hiring a head brewer. I sent an email to to Shaw that basically was just like, "My name's Brian. I've been in the industry for this long, and this is my work experience. Uh, I've been a production manager for a while, and I love what you guys are doing. Um, I'd love to be making." Beers of forage ingredients. I would, I would really love to be focusing a lot more on sourcing as much as I can locally, and I think you guys do a really great job of that. Uh, and I just want to be a part of what's going on. So, if you have any positions available for someone with my experience, let me know. If you don't, that's totally cool too. And he sent me back an email that was basically just like, "We're actually hiring a head brewer right now," which is amazing because that's really what I wanted. But yeah, I was. I got to a point where I wanted to be, I realized it was more important that I maybe take a, uh, take a different role, you mm -hmm. know, but be at a brewery that was doing something that was brewing beers the way that I really wanted to be, um, than be a head brewer at a place that I was less excited about what we were doing. So that decision is why I sent, an e sent that kind of random no. um, email. So it's tough because I, I would say, uh, in many ways, I've just helped to facilitate a lot of those things. So um, I have a bit of a forging background before I started here, um, and I think that helped a lot. So to help dive deeper sure. into those kind of beers, and uh, as you know, I think as far as agriculture goes, I think I've learned as much from the farmers we've worked with um, mm -hmm. as this place has probably ever learned from me. Yeah. Um, so. I, it's tough to say that it, it's really changed a lot to, to uh, reflect 
my philosophy of brewing or how I like approach beer making as much as it was already doing a lot of those things and that's why I came here. Okay. But um, outside of like more technical stuff, like I don't like, um, I'm not a big fan of doing like hop additions like a 20 minute, a 15 minute, a 10 minute, a five minute, a, like I just, I'm really a firm believer in either like we're going for bitterness, so we're going to do a really early foil addition, or we're going for flavor and aroma, so we're going to do a big whirlpool addition, um, or we want some aroma, but we don't want to worry about bitterness, so we're going to do dry hopping. Like, uh, so like simplifying yeah. that kind of thing, or even just like um, I think I was one of the big changes that the recipes saw here when I started here, as well as just process in general, was that I had a little bit more experience. Uh, as a production brewer, mm -hmm. so I think one of the major changes or things that maybe reflected the way I approached beer making was organizationally. Um, I simplified some of the recipes, uh, and I like to think that I improved some of them, but uh, the ma major focus, especially early on, was that we need to improve consistency and improve, we need to make sure that whatever we do, we can do again. Right. Um, so record keeping was a big thing, um, I introduced brewing logs and stuff like that, but um, most of the like, like as far as my philosophy of how I approach beer making or what kind of beers I like to make, that was what Full Steam was already doing. I think maybe the bigger impact I had was more on applying a production brewer's mindset right. to how they were operating. So um, it, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, it, it sounds like, I mean, you had already been doing things with foraged or um, agricultural ingredients already, so it sounds like what you're saying is you, you brought more of, there's more of a process thing that you feel you brought. Well, yeah. Is that, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. And I, I think the major benefit of that is that I'm a really firm be believer that in order to, to be creative or have space for us to explore working with new ingredients or, or working with a, a forage ingredient or, or even working with um, something that's like a little difficult to process or the only way you can really do that successfully is if you have a really solid foundation and framework in place so that like that structure and rigidity and like routine um, paperwork um, I'm sure my team probably thinks I make them record more stuff than they would like to but um, all of that is what gives us the room to explore these other things. Or like, if we don't have a really tight uh, process, then it only makes it even more challenging to introduce these these other elements. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think having that approach and and be, being much more serious and deliberate about record keeping and process and consistency is actually what has allowed us to explore a lot more and be more creative and. Um, and I even think that like tightening up um, our production scheduling and stuff like that has allowed more room for other beers. Mm -hmm. um, whereas it was challenging to fit into the production schedule because we were just maybe a little bit more broad in our focus and, and how we were doing things. Um, kind of bringing some of that uh, scheduling and stuff. Right. It's. It's tough, I think when I talk about a lot of that kind of stuff, people don't get as excited about it, but it's like, I really don't think we would have been able to do as much as we've been able to if it weren't for... No, that actually makes sense. For that. Um, it's like uh, mise en place or like in cooking where like you kind of have everything prepared. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way with brewing. Like I, I don't want to be weighing out hops moments before we're adding an addition. I don't want to be weighing out water treatments like as we're going in. Like. You know, everything needs everything has a place. Everything yeah. should be done ahead of time, and it's only by doing that that we then open up ourselves to be to start questioning like, is there a better way to do this, or how can we work with even more interesting ingredients, or right. um, how do we drive these kind of flavors or aromas? So, um, anyway, yeah. it's just well, and it's also important for because you all distribute. Yeah, I mean, so and, that's, and so that's kind of the other thing is yeah. that like, um, full seam, we, we take a very yes and approach um, to things. So we want to do farm to forage beer. We also want somebody to be able to, we want to be accessible. I think for both Sean and I, something that we really see eye to eye on is as 
something that attracted both of us to beer and maybe above other because like both of us like spirits both of us like wine like there's lots of really great um beverages out there i think one of the things about beer that was really attractive was that it's approachable and that it's something that that should be for everybody and should be accessible um so as much as we want to focus on farmed and foraged beers and like esoteric ingredients that I get really pumped about. Um, we also, it's important to us that you could also get a six pack of our beer at a grocery store. Um, and I think in many ways I view um, of the large scale production that we do that is often like what people think of as full steam, especially if they're not in Durham. So like maybe they only think of Paycheck or Pilsner or Humidity or Pale Ale um, as like the gateway to, it's like, well, if they make a good IPA, Right, then, then maybe I'll be willing to try this, like, you know, this goes up with blueberries. Like, it's, it's an easier, it's that kind of stepping stone to get people to, like, be like, okay, I can trust this place. They can make good beer. Let's see what else they've got going on. Um, so, yeah, I think, and tightening a lot all of that up so that that part of our production, which is really the majority of our production, you know, like 75% of what we make is, Rocket Science, or IPA, Paycheck, or Pilsner, or Humidity, or Paleo. So making sure that those are super solid and consistent and deliver on expectation um, has to be taken care of before we can worry about doing a lot of the, the stuff that's a lot, maybe more fun. Right. But, um, so and that other thing, too, is like that gives us, you know, brewing in many ways is like a ritual, right? Like you have this process that you do over and over and over and over again. Um, there's a certain order everything's done in. And, um, you know, in many ways, kind of perfecting doing that with an uh, IPA or a Pilsner is what really prepares someone to be ready to, when we're like, okay, now we're going to turn this process up, upside down. Like, only by knowing that super well can you do that. So it's, I don't know, I think it's easy to um, to forget, like, that those kind of building blocks or kind of like uh, basics are really the foundation for anything else we do. And um, in many ways, I see them as equally important because sure. they provide the basis for which we can do all these other cool things. Yeah, absolutely. So how would you describe your average week? Normally you'd ask average day here, but I know there's like weekly schedules and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, that's a... Um, it's wow. an interesting, yeah. So what are the... What are the Double-edged swords of the brewing industry, and I think something I really like, but I know some people don't, is that no two days are exactly the same. Right. So it keeps you on your toes, and it's a brewing is a pretty physical job, um, which is great. I like working with my hands, um, but it can be mentally taxing as well, and that's also really rewarding mm -hmm. because working a job that allows you to to kind of exercise both of those things, I think, helps you to stay engaged. Right. Um, so I, I appreciate that it keeps me on my toes and that it's kind of constantly changing. But I would say um, we run three uh, brewing shifts five days a week. Um, so I'm normally on one of those brewing shifts. And so that's either a shift that starts around three or four in the morning, a shift that starts around seven or eight, and then a shift that starts around 11 or 12. Um, and we could probably start a little later in the day, but we finish a little later in the day. So we're not doing totally around the clock right now. We do do that on occasion, but my average week doesn't involve that. Um, so normally um, I'm gonna run one of those brewing shifts and then uh, normally have some seller work to do. We don't have any full-time seller people, so uh, we have people who are focused on brewing and people who are focused on packaging, so all of our cellaring, so filtering, transferring, all of that is gonna be normally taken care of by the people who are brewing. So normally I'm brewing, I'll have some seller work to do, um, and then normally following that, I take care of more admin responsibilities, so like scheduling staff, um, and and then somewhere in there, I find time for sourcing ingredients and, and <laughs> recipe development. Um, and it, how that plays out each week is maybe a little different. I'm really fortunate to have a team that's like super understanding of the different demands that my job has. Right. So they've been crazy accommodating to make that all work and. Um, so Tuesdays are my guaranteed planning day. So normally on Tuesdays I don't brew. Um, and that provides me the opportunity to build out a schedule, uh, make sure our calendars is like set and 
uh, really do a lot more of the uh, recipe development side of things, as well as like uh, sourcing ingredients and uh, meeting with farmers or foraging or uh, so Tuesdays are kind of like my magical trying to get everything done days. Yeah, um, right. And then, you know, there's always like the unexpected stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't know that there's a week that goes by that there's not something that like goes terribly wrong that I'm like, oh, and now we also, on top of all of that, we're doing yeah. this. But, <laughs> um, so my normal week involves a lot of production, both brewing and cellar work. Um, a fair bit of uh, kind of scheduling and planning, mm -hmm. um, and then as much as I'm able to squeeze into it, uh, recipe development. And I mean, the part that's really rewarding about this job for me is is getting to uh, develop partnerships with amazing folks. Right. So whether that's um, you know a farmer who's growing sorghum or uh, a malt house that's malting grains grown in North Carolina, or uh, a group that's helping to protect properties around here. So, uh, you know, it, the, the kind of partners we work with are all over the place, but it's that's my favorite part. So normally trying to make sure I have a lot of time for that is, <laughs> is yeah. important to me. <laughs> yeah. So um, in early 2018, Fultstein took home four Good Food Awards, including three including for three different beers in the Farm's Ed series. So first, what are the Good Food Awards? Okay. Um, the Good Food Awards are, they're really cool. I don't know that they're super, super well known, but in the brewing industry, in the culinary industry, they're maybe a little bit better known. Mm -hmm. Their focus is on highly, uh, high, high quality, like well-made products, like things. The very first thing is that whatever wins an award has to taste good it has, and it goes through panels and it's judged and so that's like one of the first criteria but the other sides of it it's not just about making tasty uh, beverages or food it's also about uh, responsible sourcing um, and, and community engagement so um, in many ways it's a uh, it falls pretty heavily in line with kind of our our three kind of focuses so like really high quality good beer um, that is resourced locally and as responsibly as possible and also that hopefully gives back to the community yeah. in, in meaningful and impactful ways. Yeah. So um, that's what the Good Food Awards focus is yeah. and um, yeah we were honored to, to, to win three beer, for three beers and then the fourth one I imagine you're talking about the, 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 the Dusty Beatles. Yeah. yeah so McKnight had one um, for the sauces that he makes that are it, Plug for uh, for Dusty Foothills. There, there's <laughs> hot sauce is really killer, um, and McKnight's a good friend. So if you get a chance, I recommend it. But, awesome. Uh, yeah. So um, the awards are in uh, San Francisco. So and they're they're West Coast based, but there's a lot of North Carolina. North Carolina was super well uh, represented in pretty much every category. Awesome. Um, when we were there, so it was really cool to see a lot of other like. Um, Chefs and producers that right. that I know uh, take home awards that night. It was really cool. Yeah, and how did it feel to like, go up there and receive the award? Um, because it's a national award. Yeah, I mean, it is. It, so it it was very humbling, and um, it was certainly an honor to, to win. Um, it's it still feels a little surreal to be honest, uh, and I think the major thing is that it it felt. I don't want to use the word vindicating, but it felt like a confirmation in many ways that like we're on the right path, right? Like that we're doing things correctly. Like you know, the things that the Good Food Awards focuses on are some hopefully things that we're focused on all the time and that mm -hmm. we're always working really hard toward. But to have an organization like that acknowledge us for it, it, it feels mm -hmm. like someone being like, "Yeah, all that stuff that you guys are working on and that you, you say you're doing, you guys are doing it." And, and we and people acknowledge it. So, in some ways, it just felt really amazing to to have um, have this kind of like outside organization uh, see what we're doing and say, like, yeah, you guys are, are crushing it. So yeah, so that it was super exciting. I mean, it was really really cool to 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 have that experience was was just really amazing. And I, I don't know that um, I thought 
really optimistic that we were going to win at least one award mm -hmm. with the three beers we entered. I felt like we had really, we had entered three really strong beers, but I was not expecting by any means that we would win, yeah. win three. So they're all three Farms Edge beers. That's, That's right. the title. So which three were they? So um, one of them is uh, Denson's Orchard, mm -hmm. which is a triple made with pawpaws, um, named for uh, Wynn Denson, a uh, man in Chatham County who's doing amazing work to try to commercialize pawpaws. Um, it is thanks to him that I've seen pawpaws the size of almost footballs. So oh, wow. uh, I had pawpaws a lot. Um, but I, most of the pawpaws that I received, like a big pawpaw to me was like the size of a russet potato. Like, <laughs> That's like a huge pop off, and this guy is growing pop offs that are way bigger. And then the other thing about them is that they're there's uh, the fruit to pulp ratio. So like, you know, most of the time when you get a wild pop off, you cut into it and you're kind of sucking fruit off of seeds. Mm. Like the seeds are very large and they take up the majority of the fruit. And he's his pop offs will have same size seeds and just way more flesh. Mm -hmm. And despite that, opposed to like strawberries, where when you get these strawberries that are a lot bigger. They don't taste like anything. His papas also still retain this amazing flavor. So anyway, um, so keep going. It's on a no, it's um, not. It's absolutely not. Uh, so uh, Denson's Orchard, the Papa Triple, um, Alexis, which was uh, one of the early kind of mixed fermentation beers that we had done. Um, it was a collaboration with an organization called Seal of the Seasons. Mm -hmm. um, they're a company that sources North Carolina um, produce. And then, and I think they also work with South Carolina as well. But, um, and what they do is they provide, you know, farmers are often stuck in this weird situation where they may have more produce than you can really sell in a season. Right. Um, so they free, they provide the ability to like freeze and package that so that it can end up in grocery stores and they can store it. And so what's amazing is like, now if you go to Harris Teeter or like you can find North Carolina blueberries in the freezer section. Um, grown by like sometimes very small farmers and they are so seal seasons provide is this like middleman that basically because it's not economically viable for these farmers to be doing all that to be freezing and packaging and figuring out how to work with grocery stores like a lot of these folks are just like growing stuff and selling it predominantly at farmers markets and to local chefs so like to be able to have those farms then work with somebody like this is a really amazing opportunity and provides them with resources they otherwise wouldn't have so it was a collaboration of them, um, mixed culture beer that we worked with, blackberries that we got from them, um, and so this uh, kind of purple hued saison uh, that's like tart um, and very dry, and has like these wine like notes from the blackberries. Blackberries provide these really great tannins, um, so uh, that was a lot of fun. I really like that beer a lot. Um, and then uh, the last beer that won uh, is probably one of my favorites that we do is Brumley Forest. So that's actually named for one of Triangle Land Conservancy's properties. Um, it's a Baltic porter made with foraged black walnuts, foraged hickory nuts, foraged sassafras. Uh, so it relies on kind of the uh, woody and tanny notes of those nuts um, and a little bit of like kind of licorice and elements of sassafras um, to kind of play up a lot of what is already uh, nice about a Baltic porter. So uh, that's another favorite project of mine. And, uh, another one that my staff, I'm sure, is thrilled about. I think the the reason I say that is that uh, the processing of the black walnuts is a undertaking. How so? Um, so we use hundreds of pounds of black walnuts, and most black walnuts, if you've ever seen one, they're if you see one out in the wild. I think a lot of people have seen black walnuts and have no clue that that's a walnut. Um, oh. I'm like blown away by the number of people because, like, growing up, we would gather them and we either just dry them out, like after getting the holes and stuff off, just dry them out to eat like that. Or a lot of times, I think my favorite thing we did was we'd make ice cream with them, uh, which we've never had black walnut ice cream. The combination between the kind of tannin, bitter, nut, because they're not like a normal walnut, they have like a little bit more of this kind of intensity to them. But you pair that with like the sweetness and the cream, oh, and it, anyway, it works super well. Um, but, uh, so they look like, um, they're like the size of a tennis ball almost, and they're this kind of like weird greenish color. Um, and the outer flesh or the hull of the black walnut is maybe a quarter inch thick or so. Um, and, and it's got this liquid that is, will stain anything it touches a very dark black with, if it's just a little bit it gets on it, it's almost a yellowish color. So like 
our hand, we'll wear gloves. They, the gloves do not matter. Our hands during that season will be like solid black. Wow. And the stain lasts for like on your skin will last if you've got it in there good enough. Um, will last for weeks. So like we'll be done processing black walnuts and everybody's hands will still be like black and then the edges of your hands will be like yellow. No one, if you've never really worked with black walnuts, most people who have worked with black walnuts before will recognize that staining, but if you haven't, people think we have like some sort of weird disease or <laughs> something's wrong with us. But um, So getting those holes off yeah. um, and then the uh, walnuts are really, really tough to crack, whether they're black walnuts or not. They're just, they're very tough enough to crack. So um, dehulling them and then cracking them is is an involved process. And the hickory nuts are a little bit better, but they're also, they don't stain, so there's that. But, um, and their hulls are really different. They're much more um, thin and leathery versus like, kind of, um, the outside of black walnut, it looks like the texture is hard to describe, but it's it's fleshy. Um, it's, it's not like, um, like something you peel off. Like, so, um, the first year we were doing all that by hand, and we tried, you know, people love to be like, oh, well, we used to run over from in the driveway. And you can you can do that, but when you're working with like hundreds of, like hundreds of pounds, you, like there's not a good way. Yeah. But my grandmother had this like dehuller, this like, so I looked all over to try to find one of these things. So we have this cast iron, um, it looks like something from an antique, antique shop, yeah, but yeah. it's, I got it new, it's, um, and you basically put it in there and it has a crank on it and there's this big wheel of spikes all over it that rip the hole off. Wow. Uh, it looks like a torture device. Yeah, it? that's awesome. But it's super efficient. So you can just stop. So we went from like it being this like super labor intensive process to like people enjoyed actually the processing. So we, we've improved the efficiency on that. But yeah. um, either way, every year when I, gathering black walnuts is a lot easier than some of the other forage ingredients we gather. You can just pick them all off the ground. Um, <laughs> Black walnut trees tend to be pretty prolific, mm -hmm. opposed to hickory nuts, which squirrels love. There's not many critters that can get through the hole, and then if they do want anything to do with this like rock hard nut, yeah. So the um, so as a result, there's not like natural competition for them, and um, so they're like you can gather a ton of black walnuts, but if you want them, they're out there. Yeah. And Bromley Forest, where we get most of them from, has tons of black walnuts all over the place. So they're also just, they're probably a favorite tree of mine. They're really pretty trees, mm -hmm. um, kind of grand. And the, we we gather them in like kind of early fall. So it's just a really pleasant time to be outside in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, so that whole project for me is a lot of fun. That's awesome. And they were all three Farm's Edge series. And Farm's Edge is the series that you all do that's forged ingredients? Yeah, I mean, not not always. So like Alexis, for example, is like right. blackberries and like the pawpaws and Vincent's Orchard. While we do use some forage ones, are are mainly coming from Windens and um, in their farm. So uh, Farm's Edge is a series of beers that focus. It kind of like so all of our beers have some sort of North Carolina component, right? But like Rocket Science has some North Carolina barley, mm -hmm. but all of our Farm's Edge beers are ones that like where we really double down on that focus and um, we try to drive home the point more. So they don't always have a forage component. Um, and some of the forage beers we've done aren't in the Farm's Edge series. Um, we did an IPA with pine needles called Pine State, for example. Though. Or Brawny was another IPA we did with uh, with fur tips. But those, those are farm. Um, so, but the Farm's Edge, it, the whole idea is basically these are beers inspired by this place uh, that exists between the edge of, of industry and agriculture and kind of the wild. So it's kind of exploring what that concept means to us okay. and what what inspiration we can draw from that that place because that line in between the two is where we feel the most comfortable or where and then the space that like is most exciting and interesting to us. So it's it's kind of like um, a respect and understanding um, and drawing inspiration from agriculture, but also like leaning into the wild and that's why a lot of them do have mm. um, forage ingredients as well, but. So that's maybe not a great elevator pitch for what the farm's edge no, is, but no, that's great. Um, and just to, I guess succinct for a question because I think this is what we've been really talking about a lot. But what do you see as unique about Southern beer? If we're talking about the Southern beer economy, and specifically what's unique about North Carolina beer? So you know, 
it's super easy now for a there was a time when for a brewery to have a focus or for a brewery to exist, its focus would have been locally driven. And by this I mean like hundreds of years ago. Like not every brewery would have had access to what we think of as the traditional brewing ingredients. A lot of breweries would have not had access to hops, for example. Right. Um, and for hundreds of years, thousands of years, fermented cereal grain beverages were flavored with things other than hops. So when we Fast forward to the modern era, you think about a brewery in the southeast, hops don't grow particularly well here. We make hop forward beers and we enjoy them, but the real question starts becoming like, so what flavors and aromas do we focus on mm -hmm. um, if we're not focusing on that? And we kind of pull from those traditions of these older brewers, so the answer is, well, what grows around here? Right. And um, luckily we have an amazingly uh, robust agricultural tradition, so, you know, some things are easy, right? Like sweet potatoes. Um, it's I don't have to explain that to anybody. I'm like, we're a brewery that focuses on farm to fork beers. Here's a beer made with sweet potatoes. Everyone's like, oh, you're in North Carolina? Like that, it's an easy conversation. Sometimes it's a little more complicated. People don't always know what sorghum is, for example. Um, right, pawpaws. Pawpaws. But my hope and what, what I hope makes us unique and also like one of the things that I see as like a cool opportunity we have is kind of hopefully reconnecting people with things that were already here, papas, persimmons, um, and getting people to view things in a new way, sweet potatoes, sort of. So um, I think the approach to brewing is like, is how do we, how do you deliver these flavors and aromas that are true to this region and speak to the traditions and, and culture of this area um, in ways that probably haven't been done before? Because the other thing is like, you know, you think of like the there are regions in this country that have really have longer brewing traditions. Sure, the southeast doesn't really like we didn't have as many immigrants coming from brewing heavy regions. Um, distilling was a much bigger tradition. It's why you think of like American spirits, and I think most people think of bourbon, right? right? And like so, you know, we had a lot of Scottish, Scottish and Irish immigrants coming over and introducing distilling, but we didn't really have as many people coming over and introducing traditional brewing. So um, so the weird thing about brewing in the Southeast or like Southeast beer or either North Carolina beer is that we're taking these traditions and ways of, or ingredients or ways of preparing them and thinking about how do we translate that into brewing, especially modern craft brewing, which is a, even if we had a really big like German tradition of brewing in this region, we're now talking about a pretty serious departure from how they made beer. So. So thinking about those ingredients and like, and then the other thing too is like, we talk about sense of place a lot. Um, so sometimes the beer doesn't maybe necessarily have like some crazy yeah. story behind it about this ingredients in it, but it's just the kind of beer that hopefully people would want to drink in the Southeast. So being mindful of the fact that it's hot. So, <laughs> you know, it's the reason we don't have a year round like dark beer, right? Like, right. or, and tend to make things that are like refreshing is, is often a focus and like, uh, we like to make really complex beers that are intriguing and that you want to sip on, but as much as we enjoy those and want to make those, we also want to mainly make beers that someone after like a day in the southeast in September or August is going to be like, yeah, I'd still want to drink a pint yeah. of this. Um, so it's it's being mindful about, about the flavors and aromas that we can derive from this area um, and the traditions associated, as well as like the actual climate and the, yeah. like, just the real the realities of this region. Right. And so in talking a lot about farming and foraging, I think I think we're getting a lot of like the benefits. I mean you're getting your sense of place and it's really interesting. But there's also unique challenges. <laughs> I mean yeah, so can sure. you want to talk a little bit about some of those things that go along with that? For challenges and benefits if you like. Yeah. Um, so it's you know, sometimes we come across stuff that's just a pain to work with. There's no way around it. Yeah. I think a good example of this is like uh, hardy oranges or trifolic oranges. They're these small, um, maybe the size of a golf ball or a little bit bigger um, oranges that have the outer outer skin of them is kind of fuzzy almost. Um, they grow on these kind of rambling, crazy looking trees with these huge, huge thorns, like inches long. Um, and and they're, uh, they're very firm and they're loaded with seeds, um, and they're extremely tart and bitter. 
So most people don't really think of them as like this really awesome fruit, but they have all of the flavors and aromas that I associate with American hops. So they have, they have this weird pine element that I don't really associate with citrus, but they have it. Um, they have a ton of uh, grapefruit and uh, orange. And so it's in many ways, they have like just smelling the outer skin of them is very floral. It almost reminds oh. me of more traditional brewing hops from America, like Crystal, mm -hmm. whereas like the flesh is much more robust and citrusy. And so they're really, really cool. Um, but A, getting a hold of them is difficult because they grow on these terrifying yeah, trees. Yeah, those are death traps. Well, and then, so they're mainly planted. Most farmers that we work with who have them on their property, uh, they were planted as a hedgerow to like divide property. No one was growing them for the oranges. They were all grown as like, this will make a great perimeter because no animal or human will want to pass through this plant. Um, and the oranges are kind of a byproduct of it. And so a lot of the farmers we work with who have them are like eager to find an outlet for them because they're like, they just go to waste otherwise. The, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is that they are filled with this very, very intense resin. Oh. And any equipment that you work with those oranges on is gonna get covered in a thick layer of like, it's almost like pine tar. Wow. Um, and like the first year we worked with them, we threw them in a food processor and it took us days wow. of like, we tried, we have, you know, in the brew, we have like these pretty serious industrial chemicals that are designed to like clean a kettle after boiling for hours in it, right? Like, so normally when it comes to cleaning stuff, it's like, yeah, we can get some, oh, there's, there's some sort of fruit based like tar on stuff. Sure, we can get that off, whatever. <laughs> but nothing, the only thing that worked was manually scraping this stuff off. But, oh, wow. Um, so, they're, they have so like benefits, right? They have this amazing flavor and aroma. We've done a couple different projects with them. They're super bright. They have a delightful acidity. They can play the bitterness that, that we want in beer to help balance the kind of natural sweetness you get from malt. They have awesome citrus and pine notes. Um, this huge flavor profile, but then they're difficult to get because they grow on these terrifying trees. <laughs> and then they're difficult to work with because anything they touch is just going to be covered in resin forever. Um, so I think that's a fairly good allegory for a lot of the ingredients we work mm -hmm. with, where it's like the rewards are normally pretty easy to see. And right. sometimes and sometimes it's easy as well. You know, mm -hmm. like we work with uh, triticale a lot, or triticale, yeah. this is really cool wheat rye hybrid that a lot of farmers were already growing in North Carolina, but there wasn't a ton of a market for it. Um, and uh, Epiphany, it, Craft Malt in Durham, malts it. It's main, most of the stuff they get is from a company called White Hat Seed Farm on the coast. Um, we've been lucky enough to actually get to visit those farmers and check out their farm. Cool. Um, so that's super easy. It's a, it's a cereal grain, it's malted, and so it's a lot like working with wheat or rye, mm -hmm. something that we've done plenty of times. So that's an easy one, right? And the flavor impact is great. It has a really awesome mouthfeel similar to wheat, a touch of rye spice. Um, it quickly became a favorite grain of mine. But that one, you know, it's like, from my perspective, I don't really have to do a lot to, to work with it. It's great. I have an amazing local partner who's malting it, so making it very easy for me to work with. There are some awesome farmers on the coast who are doing everything they can to grow it in a quality that will work for malting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are like the two sides of the coin. So there's like right. hardy oranges, and then there's <laughs> pretty good. Um, a, yeah. But there's even, you know, and sometimes it's even deriving flavors and aromas from things that are traditionally found in beer, citrus and pine, um, but deriving them in ways that people don't even think about. So like, whether that be pine needles or fir tips versus mm -hmm. using citrus or pine forward hops or mm -hmm. um, hardy oranges versus using citrus forward hops. Um, so, and those, and like I said before, that actually, you know, people often, I, in a lot of interviews like this, I get a question like, don't you feel like what you guys do is kind of like a gimmick? And it all, it rubs me the wrong way in a lot of ways, but what cracks me up about it is that this is going back to a tradition of brewing that is older than working with hops. So. This right. isn't like a weird, like people are like, you guys make crazy weird beers. And it's like, well, we actually just make beer the way that beer had been made for a couple thousand years. 
before hops became the predominant flavor aroma ingredient. Sure, I mean, around here, molasses beer and spruce pine beer, I mean, we have cookbooks from the 18th century and... Well, that's like, actually, so when I look for beer recipes in this from this area, most of the things labeled beer are not beer in the way that we often think of them, but mm -hmm. yeah, there's people were working with these kind of ingredients here, especially in the Southeast, right. for a lot longer than they were trying to introduce um, a flower from a vine that doesn't grow particularly well here. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So another one that we've sort of hopped all over already, but what would you say is some of the, some examples or maybe some of your favorite examples of local ingredients that you use in beer? Um, Triticale black walnuts and sorghum are definitely high on the list. Um, Triticale, I'm gonna give full credit to Epiphany for They're the ones who introduced me to it. I'd, I'd heard of it, I'd never worked with it before. I didn't know what it tasted like, I didn't even know what it looked like. Um, I'm totally head over heels for that grain now, and um, and it was amazing to have the opportunity to actually go walk the fields where it was being grown oh, um, and meet the team of people who make that a reality. And it's also great to have a partner that around the corner who's who, when they first introduced it to us, and I was like, I think we want to make a year-round beer of this. <laughs> do you think that's something you guys could do instead of just being like, what are you talking about? They were really eager to figure out how to make that work. Um, yeah, that's great. So. But black walnuts, I have a long history with um, my family's. Black walnuts are something I associate with, like uh, some of my where my family lives in Georgia. And mm. It's something that I just like a lot. But then some of the other really cool, I like spice bush a lot. We've gotten to work with that a number of times. Um, every part of spice bush is different, um, so the berries are very peppery. Um, the leaves have a lot more citrus. The the s s twigs have like more uh, cinnamon and each it's it's a really crazy plant yeah. um, and it's it's native here and um, back in the day it was a really common back when like spices wouldn't have been as easy to come by in the southeast this would have been a plant that people re relied on year-round as a way to season food um, and it's crazy because the berries also have citrus in them like flavors like the leaves do but not nearly as much as the leaves and it's cool to have one plant that has three different things on it, and each one of them tastes phenomenal. Right. And it's like um, it's like all like the berries are like all spice and peppercorn and a touch of lemon. Um, so it's cool to work with beers or work with them in a beer. Or um, sassafras is, a, is another one I like a lot. Um, even uh, I think even. You know, basil, we work with a lot of basil um, to make southern basil our, mm -hmm. our um, summer seasonal. I don't know that I fully appreciated uh, the diversity of basil before working here. And, the, and by that I mean, like, I have two farms both grow in Genovese basil, like sweet basil. And the, the way the plants look, the way they smell, the way they taste, we totally different just based on the growing conditions of each of those farms. And just the amount of variance you get is like it also like you quickly start becoming like very picky about your all of a sudden you know normal um like the basil that you'll find in a grocery store is just won't cut it for you anymore <laughs> but uh i don't know there's it's tough to pick favorites just because like i can a lot of the stuff we work with i get pretty pretty amped about i the i never forget um I got some spruce tips that we were going to do a beer with. I was just testing them out, making teas with them. And the first tea I made was so amazing. Like, so the flavor and aroma that I ran around the brewery, like, making people try it. And I didn't even realize fully that this is what I was doing until I was in the front office. And I think, like, one of our, I want to say it was like one of the accounts payable or accounts receivable folks was just like, Brian, <laughs> what the? Like, this is just a jar with what appears to be um, pine needles in it. It is spruce tips. It's different. Um, at, at, like, what are you talking about? And, like, but it's, like, so it's, it's very easy for me to get animated about a lot of these things, especially that moment when you realize that the ingredient that you're working with or that you want to work with is going to be able to achieve the desired, like, flavor aroma results or maybe... In that case, like actually had elements that I just wasn't expecting. Right. Um, 
I'd worked with spruce before, but this had so much more citrus. It had so much more, it had almost like um, cola notes. Oh. Um, it was crazy. I would have drank that, like just as a tea, I would have drank that uh, very easily. It was, it was really cool. Right. Um, so there's, there's a ton that, um, I guess, I think my favorite ingredient is probably the one I'm getting a chance to work with. So right now for, I'm foraging for fig leaves and chicory oh. for an upcoming project. So I think that's where my mind's at, right? Yeah. As far as like what's at the forefront. But um, so those are really cool. Fig leaves have this really awesome um, vanilla and coconut and cinnamon tones mm -hmm. that I don't think anyone would ever expect from just, like I think most people, they hear leaves, they just assume we're going to get tannins from them. So. Uh, I think even my team here, when I was like, yeah, I would like to do a project with fig leaves, they were like, so what are we going to get from that? But they're really, really cool. Um, so, Yeah, that's awesome. So we've been talking about how you use a lot of local ingredients. So it's obvious that it impacts the flavor of your beer in unique ways. I mean, is there a specific approach you take to deciding or thinking about which local ingredients you're going to be using? Yeah, I mean, um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of products we end up doing actually start with the ingredients, mm -hmm. in the sense that like we'll have a farmer who has something um, that they're really interested in us trying out, or um, there'll be a forage ingredient that's available, and then it's like, how can we? What can we do to? The way I often describe it is like, what can we do that's going to um, help to amplify the components of this, or tease them out more, and respect the ingredient as much as we can. So. Um, and sometimes it happens the other way around too, but I would say most of the time it's like, we'll get really excited about an ingredient like autumn olives, for example, which are these uh, little red berries that uh, have a, this kind of cranberry raspberry flavor um, and a lot of acidity. Um, and it's like, so then we just start thinking, instead of kind of working backwards and saying, well, I want a beer that tastes like this, we start thinking, what kind of beer could you do with, that has those kind of flavor components that's really gonna be, um, that's really going to work and be desirable. So, uh, I think because we often start with the ingredient and build the recipe around it, it's actually easier than maybe uh, the other approach. Right. So, um, how do you? I know you've already talked about TLC. Try that. Yes. So, how do you go approach identifying and partnering with local farmers, groups, or individuals? Um, man, <laughs> every way possible. Um, <laughs> We were really, so first off, uh, when I started here, Full Steam had already developed a lot of partnerships and that made things a lot easier. But then after that, um, the amazing thing is that it kind of feeds itself. It becomes this kind of like positive feedback loop where like the more we work with farmers or the more we work with a particular farm, the easier it becomes for them to work with us. So like in the sense that like, maybe they only grew a small amount of something because they normally didn't have a big market for it. But then they know, like every year, we're, we will buy a ton of it, and then so that means the next year they're able to justify growing more of it, and then so that means the next year it's easier for us to work with them, and it kind of snowballs like that, and it kind of goes the same for working with various farmers. So like one of the ways that I, we I got to meet a lot more of our basil farmers actually was we um, downy mildew or powdery mildew is are these two guys of mildew that really destroyed the basil crop in North Carolina. And you know they come every year, um, and it depends on how much rainfall we get as how early it starts. But one year the rain caused the downy or powdery mildew death. I think it was downy mildew. Um, just trying to start blooming, or kind of I don't know what you call when mildew really starts taking over stuff. But it was destroying a lot more of the basil than we were used to. And I got introduced to other farmers by farmers who couldn't provide the basil we normally would get. They were like, well, I know this farm hasn't been hit by it, so let me introduce you to them. Um, sometimes it's even uh, making a lot of phone calls. Uh, you know, sometimes there'll be an ingredient we really want to work with, and we'll start calling for folks to try to see who grows it and might be able to provide it. And maybe they don't grow or provide it, but they know someone who does. Right. Um, so those kind of networks are really big. I think um, the willingness and openness of most of the farmers we work with to tell us about other farmers right. um, is like outstanding. I mean, the 
I don't know any farmer that I've talked to when I was like, do you grow blank? Who didn't, who, if they didn't grow it, wasn't immediately trying to tell me who does. That's awesome. Um, so that makes things super easy. Or, you know, like we wanted to work with lemon basil in a particular project, a uh, variety of basil that's really cool, has these kind of lemon notes. Um, and not a lot of folks grow it. So um, I had one farm that was growing it, but I could only get a few pounds, so I needed to find more. And every time I reached out to another farm about it, that didn't have it, they were eager to tell me somebody they knew who did, um, which makes things just a lot easier. Yeah. And sometimes, so a lot of, and then a lot of it kind of falls into our lap. You know, TLC reached out to us, um, which was amazing. Um, they they're really interested. A lot of their supporters are older, and they really want to engage. Um, younger folks get excited about land conservancy because the future of land conservancy relies on the next generation to, to care about it. Um, so I think they saw beer as a cool and easy way to get like that generation that's already excited about beer, like excited about the work they do. Um, and I think they're doing much more valuable, impactful, and meaningful work than what we do. <laughs> so um, being able to help them was huge because it just yeah. felt I think that's the other thing too is like um, a lot of and kind of getting back to some of the, the activism and community involvement um, for me at least a lot of my political aspirations and um, personal objectives sure. didn't stop when I stopped working in politics um, it's just how we go about them has changed right. so being able to help support an organization like that that I think is doing just like really important work um, just feels like such a, a big victory and sure. as a brewer it just feels like very humbling to be like you know this kind of non-consequential thing that I'm really excited about beer um, <laughs> like in the grand scheme of the world I think it's very important but it's really not the biggest deal in the world right but I can use that as a vehicle or tool to help somebody um, preserve um, wild property in the triangle which is like that is profoundly meaningful and important. And so being able to use beer as that, as that vehicle is, is really rewarding. I don't even remember the question you asked, I'm sorry. No, you're, it's, uh, you're going well. It was talking, just talking about um, identif identifying your partners. Oh. So I think, yeah. Which part of the, who are, I mean, you mentioned TLC, who are some of your local partners that I mean, work with a lot? You know, everybody from like value added processors, like, um, you know, we work with Ascazu for cocoa nibs and Counterculture and Muddy Dog for coffee. Um, those things are being grown in North Carolina, um, but they are being roasted or otherwise processed here. And um, so, like, sometimes it, those, those kind of partners. Um, other times, it's folks like um, Seal the Seasons who helps to present. Will make a way for these ingredients to go past when they normally would be available. Um, or East Carolina Organics is another one we work with a lot. They work with farmers all over um, Eastern Carolina, and um, they're great for like um, like great like seconds on fruit and stuff. Like yeah. so, as a brewer, like my fundamental job is to intentionally rot stuff. <laughs> it, it doesn't sound sure. <laughs> super appealing when you put it that way, but yeast is a spoilage microbe. Right. It's really no different than if an orange on the counter gets gets a yeast colony on it and it goes bad. I just control that process in a way that hopefully is delicious, and that's the real difference. But like ultimately, my job is to help a microbe that is normally going to try to spoil food spoil something in a way where it keeps longer. Um, and that's what fermentation is. It's it's the partnership of humans with microbes to spoil stuff yeah. um, in a way that we deem desirable. Um, so it, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I can't even remember where I was going with that. I apologize. No, it's um, a, keep going. But that. Uh, I seriously, I've totally lost my train of thought. Local partners. Local partners. So, um, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, so, I, I really apologize. I don't know where I was going. With That's okay. That's great. Um, but, um, so, we, oh, so seconds on fruit. There you go. East Carolina <laughs> Organic. Um, so, 
fundamentally, I, I want to destroy fruit. Like I, 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 I'm what I'm going to do to it is gonna. It will not look pretty when we're done. Like <laughs> that's why the photos are always of, a, of the ingredients before we use them. Right. Um, so, you know, if they if a farmer has fruit or vegetables or produce of any kind that like doesn't look super appealing, it may not do well in the market, but that's perfect for us. So um, they had strawberries, for example, uh, one year that they were like, it had rained really, really bad, and the strawberries had basically softened in the field, and they were all crazy ripe, but they were they were just getting bruised and damaged, and like, there's no way they were going to keep particularly well, um, and there's no way that they could sell them to a, but East Carolina Organics, provided this awesome ability to kind of have sourcing from all these different farms and then be like, hey, we've got strawberries that nobody probably wants to do. Yeah. And it was amazing because the strawberries tasted phenomenal. They were like way sweeter and um, more intense than like normal strawberries. They just weren't going to keep very long, but that was fine for us. We were, That's perfect. We were right. going to use them really soon and we're going to destroy them in any way. So <laughs> it's okay that they don't look pretty. Yeah. Um, so, um, partners like that, I mean, uh, you know, Riverbend, uh, Malton, Asheville, uh, Epiphany in Durham, Carolina, Malt House more recently, um, are some major partners for that. Um, we work with probably 30 different farms for basil. Um, China Lake Service has been great for forage ingredients and giving us a space where we can forage in a way that's respectful to actually land conservation, which is another thing. Um, and then, um, I'm trying to think, sorry, it's okay. um, I'm actually going to look at a menu real quick. Uh, Yamco <laughs> is this random, yeah, Yamco, <laughs> um, they're in Snow Hills, uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They source sweet potatoes from North Carolina farmers and they puree them and they separately package them. And We've worked with sweet potatoes in every form, mm. um, just straight sweet potatoes, cubes, dice, whatever. Um, their puree is, is a lot easier for us to work with. Um, they're very transparent about their sourcing, um, and it's and the makes for a more consistent beer. Um, so they've been an amazing partner. Um, uh, Triple Creek Farm is where we get almost all of our sorghum from. Uh, there's a guy there who's named Peter Fleming, whose family's been growing sorghum for several generations. Um, he's really, really serious about convincing people that sorghum is, is, an, is an important and viable crop and that there's a lot of uses for it. So he's worked with bakers and um, to incorporate sorghum flour into things and um, he's worked on like pop sorghum as like, it pops almost like popcorn. So you end up with these tiny little popcorn kernels with their sorghum, the flavor's a little nuttier. Huh. It's really good. Um, yeah. But. Uh, really passionate farmer um, who, so who's been a, a partner for, for sorghum and we've done three or four projects uh, with his with his grain sorghum and then um, you know we even work further out like uh, Muddy Pond for sorghum syrup out of Tennessee or um, Bulls Bay Sea Salt out of South Carolina mm -hmm. um, or let's see, um, <laughs> tons of different farmers yeah. for, for herbs, spices, peppers, and fruit. Um, there's uh, plenty. Yeah. <laughs> everything from. Anyway, I, I feel like I'm all over the place. But, no, uh, it's fine. It's good. Um, so, what would you say it's like to work in the craft brewing industry today? You talked about how much it's um, just changed since you even got into the industry. It's matured a lot, and uh, for the most part, in good ways. Mm -hmm. So, like. One of the ways breweries used to distinguish themselves is by making good beer. Um, and nowadays, the the expectation is that if a brewery is open and it's been open for a while, it's making good beer. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to set yourself apart in new ways. Right. So quality has moved from like uh, a unique thing to like an expectation. And I think that that's been a really good move mm -hmm. for the industry as a whole. Um, I will say. Uh, transparency of process has maybe changed a little bit. Brewers, if, if you liked the way a brewery was making a beer and you were a brewer, you could call them and they would tell you very specifically normally how they did it. Yeah. And there would be no, there's no like trade secrets, there was no, everyone is very transparent, everybody is very open and honest, um, and everybody just wanted to see the industry develop and flourish. But as we've gotten more mature, um, 
I think that has kind of gone away maybe a little bit. So I miss maybe some of those elements, but the sense of camaraderie and the sense of um, of kind of willingness to help each other is still there for sure. Yeah. Um, I think you're just less likely to get yeah. Like even like um, from a sustainability perspective, when we really started going down that road mm -hmm. and wanted to figure out like. We constantly ran into things. We were like, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Like, there is another brewery that has figured this out. Right. And um, one day, Amanda Richardson, who was uh, running a lot of her, she was our lead brewer um, and running a lot of sustainability kind of side of things. She was like, I'm just going to reach out to like Sierra Nevada and Development because both of them do a lot and in this field and sustainability. And we'll see what happens. And the people in charge of those departments of those companies. Like been over backwards to help us out and provide resources for us and give us insight to what they did that worked and what didn't, um, and helped really for us to start developing a roadmap for like how do we go forward on this issue, and that is still true for all sorts of stuff. Like same with when we wanted we wanted to get we wanted to get right with OSHA. Uh, <laughs> there's no better way yeah. to put it, but you know we wanted. We wanted to be a facility where if we got an inspection, it wasn't anything that scared anybody. It was something that we, so yeah. reaching out to larger breweries or other breweries about that, like the community's still good. People still want to help you. Uh, you just might be less, slightly less likely to have someone tell you about a source for an ingredient right. or slightly less likely for someone to tell you the specific process they use to achieve a, a result. Yeah. But it's good. I think that sense of, um, Kind of camaraderie is, is definitely a big part of the attraction of the industry. At least sure. for me. Um, and people are doing. I will say, we've also entered this like um, I don't know how to describe it other than like this Dadaism of of beer. We're in a really weird landscape where um, of like people doing very strange and, and crazy weird things to beer. Um, so it's a really weird time to be a brewer. Um, the Industry matured a lot, so it used to be just like unlimited growth for anybody who was willing to fight for it, and now that's not the case. So people are having to be smarter and more measured in, in how they grow and, and what they focus on and right. how they distinguish themselves. Right. And meanwhile, people are, like the styles of beers that are get, are coming out. Some of them are like really innovative and amazing and groundbreaking, and some of them are just I feel like um, like. Very weird experimentations that almost like exit the realm of really beer, um, but so it's just it's a weird time to be in the industry. Yeah, um, but it's super interesting, and um, I think that there's still a very bright future for it, especially in the southeast. Sure, where like the industry as a whole has matured a lot, and the southeast is still very young. You know, we don't have the concentration of breweries that you would see in the Pacific Northwest or the Northeast. Right, you know. You think about what happened, what's going on in Oregon and California in the brewing industry, and their landscape is just so different than what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still lots of towns that don't have breweries. There's still lots of towns that can handle having a lot more breweries. Right. Um, and I don't know if you could say that in a state like Vermont. Um, right, yeah. Where like saturation is really starting to, to happen. And, you know, so it's, it's exciting. It's exciting, it's a little nerve wracking, um, but it's, it's a weird time to be a recruit. Yeah. So, where do you see the industry going in the next five years? Three to five. Um, I think a continued, continued focus on um, on small, um, kind of small tavern focused um, production. So, like, I, I think the trend for a long time had been breweries were trying to grow as big as they could. Mm -hmm. I think now the focus you're going to see is people focusing really heavily on trying to sell as much beer as they can over the right. counter at their own establishment. You get a better margin on it. You don't have to deal with distribution. Um, there's a lot of reasons that it's attractive, but I think the other reason that I, I see the industry moving more and more in that direction, um, it's kind of like, I always use kitchens and restaurants and chefs as an allegory, but I think um, the room for a lot of like, large scaled um, franchise restaurants in America is slim. Like right. there's not many people who are gonna do that anymore. There's a lot of them out there, competition's pretty steep, or the entry is very high. I think so but the room for a lot more mom and pop restaurants right. 
is like limitless. I think breweries are the same way. So like, there can only be so many more um, foothills or highlands, right? Right. Like, I don't know that North Carolina is really going to see another one of those size breweries. The market's just not there anymore. Right. Um, and the ones that are established are doing a really good job. They're making high quality beer. That so it's so I don't I don't see a lot of breweries continuing to get to that level of becoming these like. I think what you're likely going to see more is kind of is more breweries that are like we're going to sell a lot of beer out of our tavern. Maybe we'll distribute to a couple of local restaurants. But we don't really have ambitions to be much bigger than that. Right. Whereas like when I got in the industry, I don't know that I met many breweries who didn't have ambitions of being big. Right. Um, I don't. I don't think that's. So I think that's the trend you're going to see a road is that, sure. that desire to be big. And instead of it being kind of um, this, we lament the fact that we can't get as we can't get bigger. It's going to be we embrace the fact that we're small, and that's an amazing thing that allows us to have more creative freedom. And um, we run a smaller crew, and but we're more focused. And, right. You know, it's so I think that's going to be a trend. I, I, it's hard to say where beer is styles are gonna go yeah uh, I don't think anyone was ready for um, New England IPA to become as dominant and like there are styles that did that right that were like they, they kind of disrupted the industry and, but it, I'm hard-pressed to think of any other style that came in where there were breweries that were opening that were like this is all we're gonna do yeah um, and where every brewery is kind of it's it's no longer a debate about how you feel about that style or, or anything. It's just consumers want that style very badly. So if you're not making it, you're probably doing a disservice to your beer. Exactly. Because people want them very, like, so I think IPA will still remain a big, big category in craft. I think we'll still see some really cool innovations. I don't know if brewed IPA is going to really become the next New England, like some people are saying. I think it's a cool thing. I think it's another innovation within IPA. I think we're going to continue to see the exploration of what it, a beer, what it, I think both of those are styles that say one thing, which is people now want hoppy beers that aren't bitter. I mean, fundamentally, that's sure. what they are. Right. Uh, they approach that very differently, but I think that exploration of what can a beer, what can a very hop forward beer look like that doesn't necessarily have some of the traditional tra trappings of a, or trimmings of a um, traditional IPA, mm -hmm. I think that exploration is going to keep going. Um, I think sour uh, beers are going to become more accessible. I think the level of acidity will be peeled back, hopefully. <laughs> and by that I mean, like, the trend right now is to make the stuff that's like, almost like the enamel on your teeth is coming off, like, yeah. where nuance and complexity is, is harder to achieve. Sure. Um, and I think brewers are going to lean more towards kind of older brewing traditions of, when it comes to sour beer and making things that are more complex and nuanced and less just like aggressively sour. Oh. But it's tough to say. I think it's very easy to gaze into a crystal ball but and not get very far yeah. as far as like what's going to happen in the future. I, who knows? Maybe <laughs> maybe Golden Ale is going to come back. I don't I don't think that's the case, but at this point, I, I wouldn't you, I would just think, okay, sure. You wouldn't be surprised at this right. point, yeah. So, um, you're moving north to Virginia at the end of the month. That's right. So what new opportunities are ahead for you? Um, that's a good question. I don't have a job lined up. Mm -hmm. um, so I am pretty nervous <laughs> about yeah. finding work. I used to brew in Virginia. I still have a lot of contacts there. So I'm optimistic about finding something. But um, I've been spoiled here in many ways yeah. about being able to make beer really the way I want to. Um, so I don't know if I'll have that same opportunity in Virginia. Um, so, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, it's an open horizon. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah, there's a lot of oppor there's a lot of there's possibilities. A lot of opportunities. Yeah. So, what's your favorite beer from a North Carolina brewery other than Polestand? Oh, that's a good question. That's the one people think about. <laughs> or style. Someone say one. Um. I think the one I had most recently was Southern Saison from Ponta Flora. Mm, yeah. Um, Ponta Flora is another brewery that's very near and dear to my heart. I think they approach beer making in a similar way to how we do. Um, and I admire a lot of the work they do. Um, and also just very genuine and good, like, friendly people. Um, makes good people make it easier to yeah. enjoy their beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But they did record something to Cezanne that was everything I wanted it to be. It was just like very, um, it was effervescent and dry and um, had great citrus tones. I think they'd worked with tea in it, so it had a really nice candid presence. Um, and I was hot out, I was doing some gardening, mm -hmm. and I had bought a bottle of all that. And it was like, this is perfect it's like for the weather, for everything. It was, it was really, really highly enjoyable. Um, but I don't know, I, it would be hard to say that that's like my favorite North Carolina beer, as much as just like, that was the perfect beer in that moment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. They're a brewery that I really respect. Um, same with like, I don't know, we're really, we're really fortunate. I'm spoiled often by their quality of beer in our region. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even within Durham, like, I'm very fortunate to have good neighbors making really high quality beer. Yeah. So, um, I'm trying to think of another beer that I had from a North Carolina brewery that I was really stoked about. Um, uh, Casita Cebeceria, um, they're a, it's a gypsy brewing operation that's mainly, most of the beers are being made at uh, Duck Rabbit. Oh, okay. Um, the guy who's running that's really cool. I've had a chance to meet him a number of times. Um, he's good friends with our builder who's in charge of sales here. Mm -hmm. um, they know each other from a long time ago. But uh, he did a collaboration with Duck Rabbit actually. I think it was called Coffee Talk. <laughs> uh, and it was a coffee stout that was nitrogen packaged in cans. It was super. Like absolutely no bitterness, very, very smooth, really great coffee presence. Um, I had it with, um, I had made, I like steak and ale pie. And, sure. Mainly, but yeah. it worked so well with that kind of rich, meaty dish. Yeah. So, uh, that was fantastic. I think uh, one of the, uh, I buy uh, hopium pretty frequently. I think that's like a beer that's often in my fridge. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's fresh, it's like, yeah, it's very much what I'm looking for in an IPA. Um, I often, I like a lot of the stuff Burial does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I'm really good friends of both the folks at Pony Industries, so I like a lot of their beers. Yeah, um, I love the fact that when I go to the Durham Balls Park, uh, the Durham Bulls uh, Park, I'm able to get beer that's brewed on site. Um, yeah, like. It, it's tough. I, I think a lot of times when I get asked like a favorite beer or favorite style, it's difficult because like it's, I love the diversity that beer has. I think it's like one of the major benefits of it versus a lot of other spirits or, or, or alcohol beverages. I think beer trumps anything else when it comes to the sheer variety of flavor and aroma you can pack into something. Yeah. Um, and so you know. Wine can pair of tomatoes better. I'll give them that. But, <laughs> but we get we get the benefit of diversity, and I think I love the fact that in whatever situation I'm in or scenario I'm in, there's a beer that is that can suit that super well. And right. um, nine times out of ten, there's North Carolina brewery making it. There you um, go. Which is really awesome. I I love that we're at a point in the industry now where like I, there's really no reason for me to buy a beer from a brewery out of state. Mm -hmm. Like. There's just enough really phenomenal beer that scratches the niche that, 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 that fills whatever niche I want right. being made right here. And that's pretty amazing. Isn't that it? is amazing. So I, th I think this might be an easy one to follow up with the hard one, but what would you say is Full Steam's flagship beer? If I just had to pick one? You can pick two. Sean picked two. <laughs> so, you know, we have three beers that we do year round in cans. Yeah. Um, and I think those are our. Do you mean like. Flagship as in like they represent the brewery the best, or do you mean like... And choose to answer it how you will. Okay. Either what people so, think of when they think of Full Steam, or what you feel is the one that sort of holds your flag. Right. So, we make three beers year-round in, in 12 ounce cans that I think of as our like flagship of core lineup. So that's Rocket Science RPA, Paycheck or Filter, and Humidity or Paleo, and maybe True Field. I think of those three, if I had to say which one of these is really our, like, our truest flagship, of the three, like year round sure. beers, would be happy humidity because because um, the other beers use some, some local grain for sure, but humidity uses a pretty significant amount of trying to kill on it. Uh, and the story of how we got involved with working with Trinidad, being introduced to it by mm -hmm. a local partner to meet these farmers on the coast, and like, I just feel like that is much more true to what we're trying to do. Than, than, and it's not to say that rocket science doesn't help to contribute to our mission. It's just 
in many ways we make rocket science because as a brewery of our size, like, you kind of have to make the beer. Yeah. Right. You, I mean, it's the reason the name of the beer is rocket science, right? Like it's, exactly. Yeah. But, and it makes up a larger percentage of sales than pitch ever did in this. But I think humidity of those three is probably, uh, probably like the truest like flagship we have. Yeah. Uh, outside of that, I think it's like what's maybe the truest word ethos or, or mission. It gets, it gets complicated. It gets pretty. Well, this will be a good question then. What's your favorite full steam beer? Uh, Which is a much more difficult question in some ways. Yeah, it is uh, Pick your baby. I mean, I think one of the ones that is a totally kind of. You're good. Uh, <laughs> um, it's an unsung hero in many ways. Uh, this beer like flew under the radar. I don't think a lot of people got excited about it. Uh, I don't think it made a big splash in the market. It lingered here maybe a little bit longer than mm -hmm. most beers that we make on that size volume. But we did a beer called um, Triple Creek, which is named for the farm we get the sorghum from. It's a sorghum brissette, um, kind of slim, lower ABV, uh, mildly tart. Very refreshing, had really nice citrus um, fruit uh, ester tones from yeast, uh, really great uh, nuttiness from the sorghum. And uh, that was probably one of my favorite beers we ever made. Awesome. It was, it was the kind of beer that every day after work, if I was going to have a beer, that was the beer I wanted. And when it, I tried, there are beers that I think I liked more, mm -hmm. but that was definitely the beer that I lamented the most or that made me the saddest when we ran. Oh, it. yeah. So, like, uh, I think there are beers that I've been like, wow, this is this is a much better. This is the kind of beer that I would take to one of my mentors to be like, you didn't right. totally waste time on me. There, right? yeah. But but Triple Creek was the beer that like when it kicked, I was like, we're really out of Triple Creek. <sighs> That's not like yeah. that, <laughs> because it didn't do like particularly well. Like if people didn't get super pumped about it, uh, we might we likely never do it again. Yeah. Uh, so. I think knowing that too was definitely like made it maybe even more like nostalgic. So yeah. that's definitely been a favorite of mine. Uh, Is it your favorite recipe you've done? Slightly different question, but that's tough. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's there are beers that I make, uh, and I don't make many of them that are very selfish. Right. I make them because I, I want to drink that beer. Triple Creek is one of them. A lot of my favorite beers that I've made here, it's it's typical because uh, every once in a while I'll make a project like that. But for the most part, I always try to keep in mind what I think. Because a lot of all this stuff, right, like uh, supporting local agriculture, it doesn't, it's not meaningful or impactful if I can't get people on the other side of the bar excited about it. Right. So this means a lot of times avoiding um, styles or things like that that are maybe going to be less appealing to a wider audience. Um, so, so when we do those products that are like, I think a lot of those are my favorites. They're the ones that I get the most excited about. Mm -hmm. They're kind of a double-edged sword because they're often the ones that don't maybe do as well. Right. We did a Gruet a long time ago, like a non hop beer. I like Gruets a lot. People don't get excited about Gruets. Right. But, um, uh, we did a Grotzer, which is like uh, this really amazing, like refreshing, crisp uh, wheat beer that happens to be oak, oak smoke. So it's like oh. smoky, but also it's like all of the elements of a of a refreshing, crisp wheat beer, mm -hmm. uh, but then smoked. And uh, that juxtaposition is, is like very intriguing to me. And, and uh, it's an old Polish style that's really obscure. It also did not do particularly well. Uh, but I love that beer. It was called Low and Slow. It was uh, we smoked it with old barrels that we couldn't use anymore, um, North Carolina wheat um, that we smoked out back, and it was delightful. That's and amazing. A couple of chefs I know got really pumped about it because they were like, "This works with food in ways that I didn't think beer could." They're like, "It's both smoky but not," because like normally for beer to be smoky, there's some other associated flavors. Like normally it's darker. Like, I was gonna say like a porter. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
So I know some chips are gonna talk about it, but I, I think, you know, it, for the most part, it was, that was the recipe I got really excited about that was more for me than maybe <laughs> less for, for the market. That's awesome. Um, but, so I think a lot of my favorite moves would fall into that category. Well, that, that makes sense, actually, because you're, you're getting to stretch your legs. Right. Yeah, great. That's all I have. Is there anything you'd like to add? Anything I didn't talk about? What you do in your spare time? <laughs> I like gardening a lot. There you are. I read a lot. Uh, I've spent as much time in the woods as I possibly can. That, surpri which, that surprises me. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, my uh, my loved ones often joke that the whole foraging thing is just an excuse to keep me in the woods more. But um, partially it is. I mean, I think foraging in many ways, part of the alert and the appeal is A, getting to connect people with ingredients that are all around us that are amazing and um, that in many ways our culture has lost touch with. Yeah. Um, but selfishly, it's also very much a, a reason. It's amazing that for part of my job, I get to go out in the woods and collect black walnuts yeah. or elderflower or sassafras or, I mean, it's, so that's, anyway. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate it. Yeah, this was helpful. For you. It was great. <laughs>